What's going on, family? I'm Scrapbook Boxing, the Museum of the Forgotten Fistical Series. I'm going to continue my conversation with you concerning the complete history of boxing. Now, I've covered so many things in this series. We went through so many pieces of information that of importance. We covered the colored division. We colored the bare knuckle era of boxing. We spoke of 1910s. 20s, 30s, 40s, and we are currently speaking of fighters and fights that took place in the 1950s. So before I move into the 1960s, before I take this conversation further, I was laying on the couch trying to figure out if there's something that I missed, something I didn't cover. And I want to make sure, because see, I don't write any of this stuff down, so I don't have anything to go back to to find out what I did not discuss unless I go back through the videos. And I don't necessarily do that all the time. So I don't believe I covered the rules. I know I talked about the 1920 Walker Law with Jimmy Walker. They took over the Hawthorne Law. But I don't know if I talked about some of the important rules that led from bare knuckle to gloves. So let's talk about the rules from the bare knuckle era to the glove era. Let's stop there in this video. So, in order for me to do that, I have to go back to Jack Brockman. He was the fourth heavyweight champion of England. He was the protege of Jim Figgs, who was the first heavyweight champion of England. Jack Brockman came up with the seven rules of boxing in 1743. So, let's go through those rules and we will have a better understanding of what those seven rules were. Let's go through them one rule at a time. So when a fighter has fallen, he has been brought back to a chalk square line and he had to stand three feet away until he was resumed fighting. Second rule was a man must return to the side of the chalk square ring within 30 seconds. Otherwise, he would be considered knocked out. Third rule, no one other than the fighter would have been allowed in the square during the fight. No one allowed in the square during the action except the principals and the referee. Very important information because that made the adjustment from what was to what currently is today. The next set of rules. No champion would be considered a loser unless he is knocked out. The seconds cannot speak or advise their charge with any information because if they were to do that, they would be interfering with the rules that were set by Jack Brockton. That was very important because it allowed the fighter on his own admission to make choices of whether he wanted to continue or not. It didn't give him any help to try to continue fighting. So they had to put some, they had to set some standards Because before you can go over, grab your fighter, one man grab him by the legs, the other one grab him underneath the arms, and you can carry him back to the side. And then you had a lucrative amount of time to get him back uh, fighting again. You could take a a wet towel or sponge and you could revive him and so on and so forth. You couldn't do that anymore under those set of rules. So that was very important. And that helps set the standard of what's going on currently. Uh, the other rule was the you had a bottle man. He basically had one knee on the ground and the other foot on the ground. If you can kind of posture how I'm trying to explain this, where you could sit on his leg. He was the bottle man, and he was the one that would feed you water and so on and so forth. So that changed. Bottle winner will receive two-thirds of the money, Publicly, in the ring, nothing was done privately. Now, the difference between that time and now, you don't announce who's winning in between rounds. Today, you did then, under those set of rules. Everything was announced publicly. The amount of money that was won. Because based on... Who would win the bout? They would get the bulk of the money. 
So you didn't have an A side, B side as you had today. It was based on who won. They got the bulk of the money or it was winner take all. And that obviously was contracted before the contest would, con you know, would, would take place. You would have two empires. They would select a referee. Now, when you go to John Graham Chambers' rules, now he was born 1843 in Wales and he died 1883 in Wales. He lived to be 40 years old. He attended a college in Cambridge and he met John Shadow. His name was John Shadow Douglas, 1866. He founded the Amateur Athletic Club, very important information. In 1867, he created 12 rules to govern boxing. His name was John Graham Chambers. He devised the eighth and ninth Marcus of Queensbury rules. Now, what are those rules? Number one, the fair stand-up boxing match, 24 square foot ring, and it had to be turf. No wrestling or hugging. Three minute rounds, one minute in between. 10 second count for the fallen fighter, neutral corner, is where a man had to walk to. Now, we're going back to the 1800s when this was implemented. It started with John Graham Chambers. Now, you had a man on the ropes with feet off the ground. He was considered knocked down. So if his foot was still on the ground, and he fell down, he wasn't knocked down. His foot had to be off the ground, lifted off the ground, in order for that man to be officially considered knocked down. A very important information. Very important. Why? Because today, if a man's foot is on the ground and he's leaning with his glove on the canvas, that's considered a knockdown. But at that time, Going back to John Graham Chambers' rules, if his foot was off the ground and he's laying down with his, with his glove on the canvas or on the, on the turf, he was considered knocked down. But if his feet were on the ground and his glove is on the ground, he's not considered knocked down. I want you to pay attention to those details because that's where the revolution of boxing would change. And that's why you cannot compare fighters from error to error because the rules change, the circumstances change. You'll find out later on that the ring had changed. You had wood underneath the, uh, the ring before you had turf, before you had red clay. Everything changed over time. So obviously the circumstances, what men were able to get away with had changed. So you have to judge fighters in their own errors. New fair-sized boxing gloves to be worn. Very important. Referee decides the time and place for the bout if it's interfered by the police or weather. That was up to the referee. He made the decision where the fight was going to be take place in a, you know, if they have to continue another time. So that's very important information to understand. Any broken or torn gloves must be replaced. That's why they would now have placed a second set of gloves at ringside because you had that happen many times where there were torn gloves and they didn't have a replacement. So under these new set of rules, that was now implemented. Man down on one knee is down if stuck or if struck with the uh, winner. So if a man gets hit and he goes down on one knee and he is hit again while he's on one knee, then the man who hit him while he was on one knee will be disqualified. No boots or shoes allowed with springs. Now, you had 
a point in time where you could have spikes underneath your shoes, two in the back and one in the front, two on your heel and one at the toe part of your bottom of your soles. That was no more. Now, the balance of London prize ring rules was accepted. Handkerchief tied to the stakes. The winner gets the bulk of the money. And that was very important during that time. Now, the London prize ring rules, the word start from scratch came from a scratch line that was drawn in the center of the ring. If a fallen fighter was knocked down during the fight, he must get up and he must go to the center of the ring where the scratch line was. And once he did that, he had so much time to do that, he would now start from scratch. So when you hear the terminology start from scratch, that's where that terminology came from, where you would start from the scratch of the line. He would restart yourself. So that's important information to understand. A new round would begin when the falling fighter gotten up and went over to the scratch line. So once again, you would have 110 rounds because the man kept falling down. And if he got up within 30 seconds, the new round would begin. Now, you had three spikes that was allowed to be on the bottom of your soles, two on the heel and one on your toe. The word high stakes came from a bag of money that was attached to the highest or the longest stakes of the four. So when you hear the terminology high stakes, means the most amount. That came from a bag of money or wrapped up in, in a cloth of some kind or, or a handkerchief and it was tied to the highest stake. That means that stake had the most money. So that terminology high stakes would come from boxing when you had the bulk of the money tied to the highest stake because you have four stakes around the uh, square circle, if you will. Fights were on turf or on wooden decks off the squares. The fighter's second and bottle holder helped select the corner as best advantage for their charge. So the opposite side of the sun or in direction of the wind. These were the choices that those principles would be allowed to have when they're selecting where their charge is going to be and what corner. Two empires would select the referee. So once again, the scratch line, very important to understand that the boxers come up to a scratch line and they fought until one man went down. He had to fall to the ground. A referee would call time. The corners had eight seconds now to leave the ring. The fighter then had 30 seconds to get up and walk back over to the scratch line. A new round would now begin. Now, I hope we got that cleared up. There weren't any number of rounds the fighters fought until one could no longer continue. He could not get up to the scratch line. Then that fight would either be over or a sponge would have to be tossed into the ring and hit the fighter. So you couldn't take a sponge and throw it in the ring. You had to literally hit the fighter. If you didn't hit the fighter, then he could be disqualified or he would be considered knocked out if he couldn't continue. 
because he would be so incoherent, the other fighter can beat him half to death. So to save your fighter, you had to throw the sponge and hit the actual fighter. Now, if the fight passed daylight, the referee decides when and where they would fight again. Now, let's once again talk about some fighters during that time. Bill Richmond was born August 5th, 1763. He died December 28th, 1829. He was the first fighter to fight as a prize fighter. The first fighter of America to do that. He was the first fighter to become a trainer. He trained the first American bare knuckle fighter who would become the America's bare knuckle champion. That title would go to John O'Sullivan, but the first bare knuckle fighter of America who would be considered champion was really Tom Molyneux. And that's because they didn't want to give that credit to a black fighter. So it was given to John O'Sullivan as the first American bare knuckle champion, but he couldn't be the first American bare knuckle champion when he took it from Patty Ryan. But that's a different conversation. The first American bare knuckle champion was Tom Molyneux. Now, Tom Molyneux was born March 23rd, 1784 in Virginia. He died August 4th, 1818 in Galloway Island. He stood five foot eight inches as heavyweight. He fought Tom Cribb December 18th, 1810. At the Corp Hall in the Common England, 55 minutes, 33 rounds. And we know the story about that fight. Tom Cribb was born July 8th, 1781. Uh, Hanaham, England. He died May 11th, 1848. And Woolwich, London, England. He stood 5 foot 10 inches, weighed 189 to 199 pounds. He fought both Bill Richmond and Tom Molyneux. 170 pounds. Bill Richmond was 145 pounds. So Molyneux was 170 pounds and Bill Richmond weighed 145 pounds. So that would be welterweight in today's standards and Tom Molyneux would be considered a light heavyweight in today's standards. Now, Daniel Mendoza, who was the first Jewish champion, he was born July 5th, 1764 at Algate, London, England. He died September 3rd, 1836. He stood five foot seven inches, weighed 160 pounds, and he fought 1792, to 1795. He had great fights with Richard Humphreys, 1788, 1789, 1790. He was 29 years of age when he retired from the game. James Figgs, born 1684, in Thame, Oxfordshire. He died December 7th, 1734. He was a master swordsman. And he was highly respected as a bare knuckle champion. He fought from 1719 to 1730. And those are the years that he would become the heavyweight champion of the world. He had 271 fights. And he would lose one contest. Some books would tell you he was undefeated. He was England's first heavyweight champion. Jack Slack was born north of Virginia. He stood five foot eight and a half inches, weighed 202 pounds. He was the fourth heavyweight champion. And actually he was the, and, and this is where there's always an issue. He was the fifth heavyweight champion. Jack Brockton was the fourth heavyweight champion. And so that needs to be cleared up. April 10th, 1810. He became the heavyweight champion when he defeated a fighter by the name of Jack Brockton. He became the trainer of Bill Richmond, who was America's first, well, fighter. He was never a champion, but he was America's first fighter. Bill Richmond would be the first American champion to be in a championship fight, but he was never an actual champion. He fought Tom Cribb, he was a trainer for Tom Molyneux. So Tom Molyneux was America's first bare knuckle champion. Once again, it wasn't John O'Sullivan because John O'Sullivan took that title away from Patty Ryan. 
So John O'Sullivan could not be the first America's bare knuckle champion. That title actually went to Tom Molyneux. But you don't hear that in your history books. But he was the champion at that time as a bare knuckle fighter. So he was technically the first black champion in boxing history, Tom Molyneux. So Tom King was born August 11th, 1835. He was born in uh, England as well. He weighed 175 pounds, stood six foot two inches. And he won the championship from Jim Mace, November 26, 1862. Now Jim Mace was a gypsy king. He was born April 8th, 1831 in Norfolk, England, November 30th, 1910 is when Jim Figs would aspire. He stood five foot nine and a half inches, weighed 136 to 175 pounds. He went into the Boxing Hall of Fame in 1954, the International Boxing Hall of Fame in 1990. He was in a ring with Tom Sawyer. He drew with Joe Gauss. He was in a ring with him three times. John Pratt, 1851. Uh, Tom Harvey, November 12, 1852. John Gully, Tom Padlock, Tom Faulkner, Bill Darts, James Def Berkey, William Thomas, Bendingo was his name, Tom Sawyer, Nam Perel, uh, Jack Dempsey. He was in a ring with Yankee Sullivan, Tom Allen, John C. Heenan, Patty Ryan. Now, Patty Ryan was born March 15, 1853 in Ireland. He weighed over 200 pounds. He defeated Joe Gauss in 87 rounds, May 30th, 1880. Petty Ryan would lose his America's heavyweight championship title to John L. Sullivan of Boston, Massachusetts. November 13th, 1886, Ryan was killed by John L. Sullivan, three rounds in San Francisco. John L. Sullivan would take on Charlie Mitchell. He fought him in France, March 10th, 1888. It was four to one odds. Now, we can continue going on and on and on, but I think you understand where we are at this point. John O'Sullivan would lose in 1892 to a fighter by the name of Gentleman Jim Corbett, who was a banker. He was stopped in 21 rounds. He took winner take all. They fought in New Orleans. He would knock him out in the 21st round. And that would be the last and the first. Well, I'd rather just say the first glove match, but it was the last bare knuckle contest. That was really when John O'Sullivan had faced Jay Kuhn in 1889. So um, 1892, if I got the date wrong, that's when John O'Sullivan had faced the gentleman Jim Corbett. Peter Jackson and James J. Corbett had faced one another. A California athletic club in uh, San Francisco, California. Peter Jackson was the Australian heavyweight champion, the colored heavyweight champion, and a British heavyweight champion. He was known as the Black Prince. John O'Sullivan defeats Patty Ryan, February 7th, 1882. $5,000 side bet. It was the Bare Knuckle Championship Contest at the Barnes Hotel in Mississippi. Corbin and Mitchell would face each other January 25th, 1894. That was in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Now, James J. Corbett, he was born September 1st, 1866 in San Francisco, California. He stood six foot one inch. He's a heavyweight. He was a former bank teller. From 1885 to 1903, he was in a ring with fighters such as Dave Campbell, Jack Berkey, Joe Chowinski, Jake Kilrain, Peter Jackson, May 21st, 1891. Now, here's the deal. The winner was supposed to get $8,000. The loser was supposed to get $1,500. And that's the reason why they tried to make that fight. A draw. I'm sorry, they tried to make it a no contest. 
So they wound up making it a draw because they allowed Peter Jackson and Corbett to split the purse. They were trying to give $8,000 to Corbett and $1,500 to Peter Jackson when they ruled it a no contest. So the crowd was so irate, they couldn't believe that, that they put pressure and they changed it to a draw. And that's when both men would get a, a, a purse that would be split. So that's important information because we need to know exactly how corrupt this sport was even at that time. September 7th, John O'Sullivan would face Gentleman Jim Corbett. That was in 1892. New Orleans at the Boxing and Olympic Club. $20,000 was at stake. Five ounce gloves. Markers of Queensbury rules. John O'Sullivan would find himself on the canvas in the 21st round and he was knocked out and he would receive not one dime and he lost his precious belt. Now, July 8th, 1899, Richburg, Mississippi, John O'Sullivan weighed 198 pounds. He was 30 years old. He would defeat Jay Kilrain, who weighed 195 pounds. He was 30 years old. He lost 75 rounds. The referee was John Fitzpatrick. It would be the last bare knuckle championship uh, contest. They started at 10 a.m. in the morning. It was 100 degrees heat, and it lasted until nightfall. September 7th, 1892, New Orleans, James J. Corbett weighed 178 pounds. He was 26 years old. He defeated 33-year-old John O'Sullivan, who weighed 212 pounds. He would lose in 21 rounds. The professor, Johnny Duffy, was the referee. And that was the first glove bout in a championship heavyweight contest. March 17th, 1897, Carson City, Nevada, 34-year-old Bob Fitzsimmons weighed 167 pounds. He would defeat 30-year-old James J. Corbett, who weighed 133 pounds. I'm sorry, 183 pounds. He was, the referee was George Silver. He stepped in and stopped the contest in 14 rounds because of the famous solo plexus punch that was delivered by Bob Fitzsimmons. June 9, 1899, Coney Island, New York, 24-year-old James J. Jeffries, who was known as the Boiler Maker, weighed 206 pounds. He knocked out 37-year-old, 167-pound, uh, former middleweight and light heavyweight champion. Well, Barford Simmons was a former middleweight champion. He defeated non Jack Dempsey for that title. Then he would move up to face Gentleman Jim Corbett in Carson City, and he would become the heavyweight champion. And it wasn't until he moved back down after he was defeated by uh, uh, gentleman, the border maker Jim Jeffries, in 1903, when he would challenge George Gardner for the light heavyweight championship title. And that would make him a three-division champion. And Bob Fitzsimmons is one of the greatest fighters of all times. June 9th, 1899, Coney Island, New York, James J. Jeffries, Boilermaker. He would stop Bob Fitzsimmons. James J. Jeffries would now become the heavyweight champion of the world. So we'll stop right there in this video. I just wanted to make sure I touched on those rules and just spoke a little bit about some of the bare knuckle fighters that we probably covered a little earlier in our series. So I'm Scrapbook Boxing, the Museum of the Forgotten Fistigov series. All great fights, all great fighters will never be forgotten on my channel. And I wanted to touch on those things before I moved on to the 1960s, because that's basically where we are. Thanks for spending the time and listening to this conversation. It's been a long ride, but we still have a couple of more decades to cover. In this complete history of boxing series, none other than Scrapbook Boxing, Museum of the Forgotten Fistic of Series. All great fights, all great fighters will never be forgotten on my channel. Be well. Peace.